üstünde burcu çeteyi topluyor galiba değil evet, mi? Evet istiyor musunuz? Çeteyi topluyor. Ya arkadaş yani hakikaten çete de çete ama değil mi? Büyük. Siz yani, biraz etkilendiniz değil mi? Etkilendim. Yani. etkilendim. Bu arkadaşların dipteki o crime hali beni aldı götürdü. Birazdan ortam Afrin'e dönecek. Burada herkes görsen neler var. Kimler var efendim? Efendim yavaş yavaş davet Lütfen. ediyorum aynı zamanda. Evet. Security researcher known as Gentle Wiki Benjamin Dab geliyor. Alkışlarınızla. <gülüyor> You're the star man. Security consultant Brad Johnson geliyor. Hacker and researcher Chris Roberts geliyor alkışlarınızla. CEO and co-founder of CNEC, Jay Kaplan geliyor yine alkışlarınızla. Ve CISO at KPN Telekom, Jay Abalu'yu bir kez daha sahneye davet ediyoruz. Evet. <gülüyor> Kolay gelsin Gökhan Bey. Valla böyle bir ekiple aynı sahnede olmak bile muhteşem bir şey. I'm just looking at you. I'm feeling the joy and pride of being on the same stage with you guys. <laughs> Welcome again. So, it is most probably I, I, I'm going to make the again the free format today. Okay? I mean, it is we're going to talk about problems. You talked about the problems, but you just pack them all together and get some questions. What we are doing today? What are our mistakes? What are the problems and what is going to happen in the future? So, Benjamin, you were not with us, my friend. So, everybody knows you, but you didn't have the chance because you will have your session in the afternoon. It is going to be great. You are going to make the demonstration of Mimi Cats and Keke, right? It is this, this is the new uh, tool that you developed. Kekeo, sorry, right? Yes. Uh, okay. But, uh, but I was but I was lucky because I was uh, uh, in the front row to listen others this morning. So it was okay. great. <laughs> just just for the ones who don't know you, uh, please tell me. I mean, it is a very interesting story that you have how you built Mimi Cats and what happened happened after then. You know, some uh, agents came by. <laughs> I, I I know the story, but a couple of minutes, please please introduce yourself. So I'm Benjamin Delpi, I'm nearly always with this green fashion shirt, so it's, it's very easy to spot me. But originally I developed Mimikat, uh, this is a, a great tool, uh, to learn C language and Windows internal stuff. Uh, it was in 2007, uh, uh, seven, eight, it depends. But in 2011 I discovered some way to dump clear text password in Windows, which was very interesting in a researcher point of view, but also an attack point of view. I know now that the, in the NSLX, they already have the same technology, so it can be very interesting. But the Russian's uh, PhD's conference strangely invited, invited me very quickly in Russia to make a conference just about it. And Exactly at the, uh, at the same conference, uh, it was my first conference, I was very nervous. I was in the great President Hotel in Moscow, very nice. But just uh, at the hotel, my Wi-Fi was not working, my internet was not working, plug two. But I was going in, at the, in the lobby to ask some help about the internet. And strangely, they didn't ask me to reboot my computer. They said, hey, Please wait, a technician will come with you to help you in the room, but please wait here. Which was very strange. And I say, okay, no, I will not wait, I go in my rooms. Please wait here. No, 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 I will just wait in my room. And when I enter my room, there were some strange guys in front of my computer, which was locked off purely, un encrypted off purely too. Uh, on the moment, I was not aware about nothing. It was, oh, the guy was very nice. He was, oh, please, excuse me, my, my, my key, open your doors. It was an error. Yes, of course, yes. 
but it was before my conference. I can say I was very nervous and I just decided to release the source code of Mimikatz about the clear text password part few hours early <laughs> because I don't want it to have some problems when I was leaving the country. Because they were, they were very nice but very impressive too. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, so, you know, what I want to do, guys, you talked all about the problems, but please tell me uh, one top problem in, in the sector, in, in security today, what we are facing, just, just one, and let's vote it, the worst of all, okay, and let's start talking on that. Can you do that? What is the worst problem at all in security? One thing. Uh, sure, I could start. I mean, I think uh, to me it's the lack of talent. There just aren't enough people out there to, to uh, solve all of the problems, I guess. Lack of talent, okay. Uh, what is the biggest problem? I think I will leave some your problems, but I, I will say is legacy problems and executive. Legacy problems. I mean, using the legacy. Dealing with legacy. Dealing with my, my human mindset, okay. Accepting legacy. Okay, perfect. Accepting legacy, the mindset. Uh, to me, the largest problem is that we have become accustomed to breaches and, de and, and loss of data. It's something we're used to, we expect, we're not surprised by it anymore. Again, please, just summarize it. Again. Uh, again, the biggest problem to me is that we have become accustomed to the data breaches. We, we, we are no longer surprised by them. We're not, okay. Ignorance, maybe. We accept it, acceptance. Yeah, we do. I think for me, uh, one of the biggest issues is probably the supply chain. So as an organization, we do the best we can to look after ourselves. But if I hand data to you or I hand data to somebody else or somebody's coming into my environment, the supply chain is one of the areas that we attack on a regular, regular basis. And it's one of the weakest links. Jaya. Yeah, so I've got to take the one that's not been taken. Um, <laughs> but I think it's really fair to say that there's a majority of the problems that we already know about that we're incapable of solving. So like really stuff that you can just find on Shodan or a simple vulnerability scan. And we are, as of yet, as a country, as a company, incapable of solving them with any form of rapid response. And I don't understand why we can't do that. Okay. Which one is the top one, guys? Talent management, legacy problems, acceptance, third party. Your problem in one word, Jaya? Response time. Response time, okay. Response time, legacy problems, talent management, acceptance, third party. Can we just, okay. can we just blame the vendors? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's easy. I'm also one of them, but okay, no problem. Do it, open. Yeah, because like, to be fair, you know the legacy stuff, right? I figure that everything is legacy. Once you finish right. building it, it's legacy. Yeah. Right. Okay, so let's start with legacy. What do you want to say? It is on my, not only the mindset, right? Also the, the tools that we are using, the infrastructures that we have. We are having that legacy problem in technology, in mindset, everywhere. We, what would also, you like to say about it? You also get, I mean, for the legacy for me is, again, how many of you in the audience have been told by a vendor or a supplier, you can't update it, Yep. You can't patch it, you're not allowed to touch it, you're not allowed to fix it, you have to leave it alone because that's the warranty, right. that's the support, somebody else is dealing with it, or I'm sorry, it just can't be touched. Can, can I just add one thing to that? Please. The, wor the worst of that is when they say, you know what, there is an update, you're actually operating end of life, but there is an update. And that update is only going to cost you a couple of million. Oh. <laughs> Oracle, um, no. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, most probably we are going to be alone after this day, as in the event, I nobody will be willing to work with us. But continue, guys. Okay, um, would you like to add anything on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to think of what what is the solution to legacy um, and. Perhaps, and this is just an idea I'm thinking out loud, 
we should have policy enacted that says vendors who are selling software to companies are responsible for the security of those products indefinitely. Um, and there's no such thing as end of life as it relates to security. Is that a possibility? I don't know. No, because no. how, how, many, how many companies do you know that have sold software for 20 years or are out of business oh, now? Business. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, or they've been bought by McAfee yeah. and, and, then, and then spun <laughs> off or they've died. They've sure. gone to the McAfee That's death. That's fair. You know, I, I mean, there's so much of that. For me, we talked about it earlier on. It's like if you have something legacy, you know what? Accept it, segment it, separate it, put the controls in place to actually understand the risk. I would love that, right? Except like, let's talk about hardware software support. How many of you have a phone that you want to have permanent software support on, <laughs> right? So when, it, when we extrapolate this to IoT devices, when we extrapolate this to things that we put out in the field, it's impossible to guarantee uh, hardware and software support for the lifetime of the product, and that's the dilemma that we have. Yeah. So I think there's got to be some sort of either compelling legislation or a sense of own responsibility towards a, a customer base that needs to live on with a product, and you need to kind of figure out how to match that. I, I think what, to be honest, I know we're, we said we weren't going to talk about WannaCry, but to be fair, I think you know, we tend to rag on Microsoft a lot in the past from the security community, but they did a really good job of providing support for free in a moment of need for hospitals, uh, for uh, manufacturing places, all places where they couldn't upgrade before. So they, they did a really good job of support there. Any other issues? I, I think on legacy, you, you, you speak about the idea that vendors say you can't upgrade, you can't change it. It's totally false. You can't change, you can upgrade, you can remove the hardware to have other ones it have a cost. Sometimes it's a big cost, but think about security. If you have some issues, some problems, some leaks, because of your legacy, all the costs will be absorbed by the, by the leak on all the problems. So maybe don't trust the vendor, challenge them. Sometimes it's more easy for you to, to trust them that you cannot change the legacy problems. But I can assure you, you can. When you have some old mainframes, I think all your administrators will be happy to go to a new database systems instead of the old mainframes that work it for years. So th think about it. The cost is nothing if you, if you will have a problem because of the legacy. Don't trust vendors about that. They lie. They lie because you will give them money to support <laughs> it. <laughs> You're right. We're going to be alone at the end of this. Yeah, I was just leaving, guys. Please continue. <laughs> Well, what happens, like, I work with uh, some medical providers in the United States, and a lot of the times, systems in medical, in hospitals and things like that in the U.S., they, they have updates available for legacy systems, and they're just, regulations prevent them yeah. from updating yeah. the systems. They lose certification. Right. They, your MRI device, your magnetic resonance imaging device, is, because of the HL7 protocol, right. is, like, dependent on a... <laughs> crappy version of Windows. Yeah. And, and the problem becomes, that's, that's one of the reasons that medical systems in the United States, it's wide open. The, the, the ability to get data to compromise those systems in a medical environment is wide open. Attackers can almost go in at will and do that kind of stuff. So here's, here's the caveat to all of this. Um, perfect example, RSA. RSA this last year, 500 vendors on the floors. 500 huge vendors, every single one of them saying they can fix your <laughs> HL7 problem, they can fix your IBM problem, they can fix your management problem. Bullshit. 490 of them are lying to you. How do you tell? How does the sea levels out here know who's actually telling the truth? And as you can tell, Chris is not outspoken at all. <sighs> Civilized. <laughs> we weren't on the RSA floor, so you can trust us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, You're I, on a hacker-powered platform, right? I have, I have the same opinion to vendors. I work with a lot of uh, retailers and merchants, and, and what I typically see with vendors, security vendors specifically, is that they'll come up with a product. The product tends to be okay to begin with. Mm -hmm. They sign up a lot of customers. They never innovate on the product. They never update on the product because studies have shown that once someone signs on as a customer, 
that person tends to stay as, as a customer for years upon years. Plus, exiting out of the security software is difficult, to say the least. That, that's the problem, is as you come up with a, with a product, you never innovate, you sign up customers, you literally don't care about the customers, you just collect the money. And hopefully, someone buys your security service later on. Or buys the company, which means it's somebody else's problem. Right. That's, I mean, you think about it. Think about how many companies, again, US especially, Think about how many companies in, in from a, an investment standpoint are there, get key customers, get key clients, make the company big enough, and then sell it to somebody else. Security shouldn't be about making millionaires and billionaires. Security should be about protecting people. It shouldn't be, I mean, yes, okay, you have to make money, you have to make a profit, but it sure as hell shouldn't be about how can we make the next but millionaires and billionaires. doesn't say so, my friend, right? Yeah, the, I know. The problem is that, you know, I mean, unfortunately, yeah, yeah, they say money doesn't bring happiness, but it brings some maturity, right? Because <laughs> at the end, it is, security is only 2% of the IT market. So there are 4 trillions, you said $19 billion, but, you yeah. know, it is, it is small money when you compare it with the big, the big IT market. market. And look at the game. I mean, we have the startups. And these guys are the good guys because, you know, they don't make money. You know, they, they don't want to be the billionaires as a beginning. They want to sell their companies. But they are the innovation engines at the moment. Yeah. Those are not the huge gorillas who is doing all those inventions right there, right? Yeah, it's, it's a balance. Exactly. And coming to another point, I mean... Uh, Yes, all these, it is also coming to the national security problem, right? You talked about it. I think Kaspersky did a great thing and they were brave enough to open their code and come and just check it, guys, if you can find any vulnerability or backdoor in my software. I think they did a great thing and I, yeah. I believe every, every, we are also developing software and mm -hmm. everybody has to do that. It is yeah. because we need to trust each other at the end of the day right. because we yeah. are separate from our uh, governments and it is not, it is, we are global companies at the end of the day. We have the responsibility of so many customers out there but that responsibility is coming to us opening our code so that everyone is trusting us. Yeah. I, I think you made an interesting point about kind of the, if you put into perspective the amount of spend in security versus relative to our IT budget. Um, if we take a step back for a second, I think at the end of the day, these vulnerabilities are coming from developers. These vulnerabilities are coming from misconfigurations. It's still a human problem at the, you know, at the very beginning of development, whether it's a third party piece of software or we're developing it in house. We are still not educating the people writing this software about security. They don't know enough about it from the ground up. And until that changes, these vulnerabilities are going to persist, they're going to continue. Um, and, you know, I, I think fundamentally, at the most basic level, um, we need to be instilling a sense of security in the people who are writing this stuff in the first place. This is a very important topic, I believe, because, you know, it is not only security, it's all the software out there and it is gonna be 10 trillion lines of codes yeah. are gonna be developed in the next five, five years with the companies, by the companies who hasn't developed any line of code five years before. Yeah. So what do you think about this? What is, what is the future? I think it's, it's, it's to play off of that. It's up to us. It, we can't, yes, it's developer, but it's us. We have to be the ones going out to the development teams, potentially putting better systems out there to help automate where possible, to help train better, to help be more effective and make it compelling. Not make it, you have to do this. Go, okay, how can I help you understand what you need to do? It can't be a blame game. It's back to that. It's all of us have to work together to fix the problem. Can I, can I add something there? Because I fully agree with this. And the issue is that you know we tried to show developers what are the most common vulnerabilities that we see in code, and that we give them an idea of how to develop securely. It is shocking, of course, that they don't already know this before they begin developing. 
What I think, though, the, the part of the answer is, is not just making sure we get control of the developers and helping them, but also understanding how we integrate modules of open source software into regular products. How many of you lived through Heartbleed? <laughs> no, yeah. really, how many of you lived through OpenSSH vulnerabilities? So if you've ever seen this kind of stuff happen in, in your organization, then you'll see that your hardware equipment manufacturers cannot tell you which open source libraries they have integrated into their products at any given time. That is inexcusable. That's like not having a bill of materials at sale. You cannot do this. So I think that we should demand that there's some sort of transparency into integrated libraries, because it's not just about like a, a developer, it's about a fundamental flaw that we don't know, you know what we put into the mix of our cookies. So, so, so some of the stuff we're doing back in the US is the DevOp days and DevSecOp days that's sponsored by Sonatype. And the guys at Sonatype hold like the Java libraries and a bunch of others. So they're able to basically fingerprint everything in the code up to that point. It's fantastic. Um, they're doing an amazing job of it. And I mean, it's, you look at the statistics of, I mean, the amount of billions of downloads yeah. and how many of them are still flawed. Yeah. Um, so the tech is out there to fingerprint at least a chunk of it. We just have to get everybody to but, use it. But isn't the challenge, even if you know the open source libraries, you still don't even know wh what no. the vulnerabilities are in them. So yeah. does it really solve your problem? I well, mean, how do we audit those open source libraries and how do we get better visibility into, you know, which ones are vulnerable, which ones have actually undergone a, a, a certain level of scrutiny from a security perspective that makes us all confident that we can use them? No, but I mean, there's, that is a multi-part. Two separate questions. That's a multi-part problem, right? So yeah. the first one is, do you integrate this library with this version? Okay, that, that's the first part of it. And I think that if we buy stuff from, I don't know, Cisco, um, if we buy stuff from some certain vendors, that they should know what's in there. And I expect then, when there is a release of a major vulnerability on an open source tool that we're all using, that then they say, oh, by the way, you may also have problems with this. And by the way, we have this in this, 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 and this device. Just that. And then, of course, we have to verify the veracity of, or the validity of that actual library itself. But yeah. So are we sharing, you know, guys, I mean, this is a very important topic. I mean, the bad guys are sharing a lot, Brent, right? Oh, yeah. You, you know that. Everything. But are we sharing enough? Or are we under the pressure of, regulations, you know, some commercial problems, NASDAQ, whatever. So are we sharing enough as the good guys? What do you think? Well, I mean, just, just from a criminal point of view, <laughs> the, the way that that community is built is for sharing. That's what it's all about. For example, if someone has an exploit on how to, how to steal a product or a service, he'll mine that out within his specific geographic area until it's no longer viable, but it's still viable elsewhere. So he shares that information. Not only that, but he shares that information with his internal, with his internal group so that they can better make it more efficient, can cash out to a higher value. When I first started on this legal journey of mine, one of the first questions I asked at, at my first paid speaking engagement, the, uh, the lady who brought me in and paid for it, she, uh, we were having lunch and I asked her, I was like, uh, why don't you guys share information like the bad guys? We're all about sharing data. You guys, it's like you, you section things off, you compartmentalize, you hide, you lie. <laughs> the bad guys don't do that at all. And the answer came, well, you know, you've got privacy concerns. You've got regulations. You've got one company is one who would like to stop fraud overall, but at the end of the day, that company is more worried about fraud for their company. If he can move it to some, some other company, that's great. So it, it becomes this idea of, of you, you have to get to the point where you understand that only by sharing information, and that's not publicly, you don't have to do it publicly, but, but with each other, only by sharing information are you able to see, okay, this bank was hit over here by simply going through the router, or this bank was hit over here, a bunch of guys walked in dressed as techs, to, uh, <laughs> to check out the equipment and installed USBs. Until you start sharing that type of information, you're just, you're victims. That's the only thing you are, you're victims. And you're just waiting to be victimized. Unfortunately, yes. And 
it is going to get worse and worse and worse. Unfortunately, now we have another responsibility. It was CIA. Now we have the S, right, which is safety, IoT, nanotech, biotech. It is going to be there. And, you know, we were talking a couple of days ago. I said, you know, uh, the S in IoT means security. And my friend said, there is no S in IoT, man. I mean that, I said. <laughs> so w w what is going to happen? I'm really totally concerned. You want to add something on that, my friend? I mean, you, you, you know a lot about it, and <laughs> unfortunately, um, oh, yeah. you came together in the plane, right? So yeah, you, we did. yeah, we did. Oh, man, that's... <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't be like to be in that place. Somewhere in a little bunker, a little red light was going off. <laughs> He's causing the plane to fly sideways. I'm still in all the credit card data. It was so tough for me to find the airlines to accept you, my friend. You know, I mean, that, that was my I, biggest yeah, challenge did, to bring you in. All over the place. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what, what is happening over there, please? IoT, what is, what is future looking like? I, I, I mean, there. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I mean, it's, I mean it, okay, so if you think about it, as humanity, Arguably, we've only got a couple of paths. We either teach the people how to help look after themselves. We, we teach people how to fish. Right. Or we look at the technology and we begrudgingly accept that technology is going to take a much, much larger part of our future. And that's not just our future in helping us and doing everything else. It's protecting us. And to do that, we are going to have to accept to hand over more. I mean, what we consider privacy is, let's face it, not privacy. But I think we're going to have to begrudgingly get to a stage where we hand over more and more and more. Now, the problem is, who are we handing it to? And how is it going to get looked after? I don't know. Thoughts? I, can I say that? I don't know if it's just about privacy. I think it's more about control. Yeah. So we deploy yeah, different types of networks. So if you think, what the hell is IoT, if we really peel back the problem, let's take a look at the devices as well as the networks. So we support so-called IoT devices on 2G networks using machine to machine. Here's the deal. No operator on Earth wants to keep 2G alive while they have to put up a 5G network. No one. The only reason we do it is because there are a ton of energy companies, transport companies, other companies that are looking for telemetry data that insist we keep this old network with crappy protocols alive so that we can support those devices out in the field. That's the first dumb move we've made. We've clued out the network layer. Then you have, you know, I'm not even going to get into the devices yet. Then you have choices between narrowband IoT or LoRa. So you know we know about protocols based on ranges. So we have our short range protocols, Bluetooth, short range, about 30 meters. Then we have mid-range protocols, Wi-Fi. And then we have long-range protocols, like really protocols that you could use across a city like Istanbul. And imagine you want the municipality to have smart cities, which is like another bingo bullshit word. Um, so if we want to have all these smart cities, when you build these networks, ask Turkcell, ask Turk Telecom, they will tell you it's a really difficult thing because they want to deploy these secure networks with all the secure protocols and over the air uh, security for configuration and updates and all this stuff. But they're being held back by the device manufacturers that don't want to have all this, that cannot work or coexist in such an environment. We've suggested improvements to the standards. We can't get them actually implemented in the devices that get on the network. You build a network, you think you're building it for something that's gonna be okay and clean to support this piece of infrastructure, and what they wind up doing is putting super sensitive stuff. It's not just being used to figure out whether your garbage can is full, it's being used for Legionella detection in municipal swimming pools. It's being used to figure out how much water from the Bosphorus is allowed in canals. If that is lying to you or is hacked, you could be flooding areas. You could cause real physical damage with this device or kill people if you fail the Legionella detection or the pool detection. Sorry, I get a bit too hyper over this. <laughs> I think at the end of the day, IoT is no different than the same networks we were defending 
for so many years. I mean, we, th we hear IoT and we're like, ooh, this new scary thing. But the reality is they're just computers on in a smaller form factor doing similar things. Um, and the attack vectors are largely the same. Um, but, you know, it, it's... Like yeah. we, we still can't even defend our networks. Now we're moving over, we're moving on to much higher volume and that's the big challenge. I think yeah. that's, that's why IoT is so much more difficult. It's the sheer number of devices, um, but not necessarily the devices themselves. So does it come back to, you know, we, we've talked about the human, we've talked about the technology, we talked about the vendors and, and the industry. What's the three analogies? Build it now, build it fast, build it cheap, choose, choose two. And the problem is, is we've chosen build it cheap and build it now. We haven't chosen build it correctly. We haven't chosen build it securely. We choose the cheapest, easiest, quickest way to get something out, to make a profit, to get something first to market. We're not sitting down right at the beginning going, how can we build this properly. It is the cost of adding security to the IoT device is two cents, but you lose the deal with one cent yeah. of billion devices, right? So yep. it's it the same problem with, with cars. Unfortunately, that is. We had the problem with cars. It's the same problem with cars. To put a, going back to some of the European manufacturers and US manufacturers, to put the, the necessary security chips inside the vehicle so that we couldn't hack them was like two or three or five cents. And they were like, no, too much money. And you're like, that's the cost of a human life. Exactly, and now human life is at stake, right? And right. In, as a mindset, I don't believe that we are ready for that because you know, we are designed to make mistakes in the last 50 years because we are the innovation machine, the engine for the world, for the digital transformation. So at the end, these guys are telling us, okay, go create those vulnerabilities, bugs and everything, but bring me that software which is going to give me that nice service so that I change the world. Yeah. But now, it is different, it is human life. Yeah. And I'm really concerned with that. And, and I think, I mean, you guys, I, we talked about this kind of offline. When we grow up as kids, we're told, don't touch something hot. What do we do? We touch it. We have to experience, uh, for whatever stupid reason, we have to experience something in order to be able to understand it. As companies, oh, we won't get hacked, he'll get hacked, or she'll get hacked, oh, I'm perfectly safe, until we get hacked, at which point we're like, oh, well, that did happen to me. I think, unfortunately, until we have more than just one and two loss of life, until we have mass loss of life, I don't think we're going to pay attention to it. Uh, tell yeah, me I'm wrong. I, we All were right. talking the other day about how just desensitized we are to uh, cyber incidents. Yeah. I mean, Marriott just lost 500 million records. Yeah. No one's even talking about it anymore. It's like old news already. Who cares? Who's what in the news yeah. for there six hours? There are so hours. many of them, right? Like, it's unbelievable. I mean, that's more than the population of the United States. I mean, that's crazy. Bre uh, is, this, is this coming to your saying, acceptance, ignorance, acceptance? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there, so, there are so many breaches. Last year, we had reported, just reported, 1,500 breaches. Of those reported breaches, 2.6 billion records compromised. That's just last year. Everyone's information is out there. In Turkey, before I came to this conference, I bought the Turkish Citizens Database for $10. <laughs> yeah. For $10. I was going to have a presentation on that. It was like, ah, we better not do that. <laughs> yeah, for $10. Yeah, yeah. Let's That's mask 24 it, man. million Turkish citizens information <laughs> for $10. That's just one database. I mean, everyone's information is out there. The reason, the reason you've not been victimized, the reason your company has not been hit so far is because there's simply just not enough criminals out there to do it yet. <laughs> but they're coming. They're coming. Cybercrime, I was, I was involved in cybercrime when it was an individual affair. I saw it grow to a business. Now I've seen it grow to its own economy. Last year, global loss is $600 billion. Yeah. It is a problem now that governments cannot arrest their way out of. We have to figure out other ways to combat it. We have to, to, to figure out 
what to do. Because the day is coming when you have cyber criminals who adopt this, this philosophy of patience, of taking their time, waiting in a system until they're considered legitimate throughout. And then what happens? That's a problem. So we are both uh, us, the creator of, the, of these problems and the victims of these problems at the very same time, unfortunately. Yeah. So tell me, guys, what are we not going to accept? You said acceptance for the future, for the secure future, which means human life. What are we not going to accept? Please. Should, I'm starting with you. OK, well, I realize that this may sound highly stubborn, but I refuse to accept a lack of control or the loss of our total privacy in order to get more security in the bar bargain. I don't think that that's a healthy compromise, and I don't think it's one that needs to be made uh, against us. I think that there are ways to balance the concerns that we have for privacy while ensuring security. One of the things that I'm the most proudest of of the Dutch government, uh, the country in which I live, is the fact that they made a cabinet standpoint never to try to weaken cryptography, never. It's a government standpoint. I refuse to acknowledge that we would ever find a place or time where we would go back on those things. There's other things that I'm not so proud of, but I think those are the kinds of balances and trade-offs that we should be looking for. Perfect. Yes, my friend. I think for me, it's, it's ignorance. I refuse to accept ignorance. There's so much, there's so many data points. There's so much information out there. There's enough of us here, all around, that can answer the next question. The fact that companies will still do nothing more than the bare minimum to fool the auditor, to pass the audit, to get the check in the box, to me, that's one step away from ignorance. And I refuse to accept it. We know what we have to do. We know what the right thing to do is. Just bloody do it. <laughs> what are you not going to accept? With me, I, just, I, I refuse to believe that we can't do a better job. Yeah. You know, I, I refuse to believe that we can't do proper security awareness training instead of doing it for compliance. Yeah. Do it to make a difference. Who cares if you don't get 100% mark on it? Do it to make a difference. If you're a security company, why are you there? Are you there to make money? Or are you there to actually do some good? That, that's, I, I refuse to believe that. I mean, I, I've, I spent 20 years, 20 years as a cyber criminal. I'm one of the most well-versed people on the planet as far as cyber crime goes. I'm on the good side now, and I see a lot of these issues. And I'm like, I, I just cannot believe that we can't do a better job than what we're doing. Benjamin, what do you refuse, man? On my side, it's a little bit utopia, but <laughs> I refuse to accept that uh, company will start to, um, to, to value your privacy, your data, at the, just at the moment when they are hacked to, or to the dollars, to, the, to their intellectual properties. Because at these times, you see, there is a lot of leaks, and nobody cares at all. But I can guarantee you, if you stole their data, their real data, their <laughs> secrets, if you stole their, their euros, their dollars, they will change some things. But at this time, the only way you have to make company change their point of view about security is to hack them, is to eat them in their... Or, um, on some things they are very interested and they are not interested at you at all. So I refuse to accept that, but I know it will be difficult to make, this, to make exactly. them change. Right. Um, I'll give you a little anecdote. So just a couple months ago, when a, a major corporation in the US that we currently do business with notified us that they're not going to be renewing their contract with us. I asked, you know, I, I was like, that's crazy. We've been doing some great work for them. They've gotten you know, a lot of really good uh, vulnerability data from us. Um, what, what, why? And so I talked to this, the chief security officer, and he said, look, you guys are just too good. Like, we can't keep up. 
with the number of vulnerabilities you're finding, we can't remediate them fast enough. So we decided to shut you off um, until we can fix all of the problems. We think it'll take another year or so, and then we would like to turn you back on. That's the world we're living in today. Yep. I mean, it's crazy. It's like, let's, let's look the other way. Um, it, it is the ignorance. Yeah. Uh, it's the basics. Um, it's the, you know, we hope no one notices um, mentality, which is insane. And I refuse to believe that's the world we live in, um, where you are responsible for security of this major organization, yet you are so naive to think that the, the people that are attacking us every day are not going to attack you um, while you go fix your vulnerabilities. I mean, it's just crazy. And, and you know... I'm give sure us, you guys have lots of examples exactly, of this as well. Yeah, give, yeah. give us the name. We'll deal with it. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. no, but Me? this is everyone. I have this too. We all have this. The problem of a red team is they will always find stuff. And the defense team is always slow to fix. We actually monitor what's the longest open standing vulnerability. And how long do we know about it from red team or vulnerability scanning? And how long have they not done anything about it? You know, so everyone and, has And we this. get it. Look, there's a lot of noise. There's, you know, you, you, you have to prioritize, but... I wish. You know, it's just, it's not an excuse. Um, no. And perhaps it does go back to the talent problem at the end of the day. There, isn't, there aren't enough people to fix these issues. Um, let's solve that. Let's, let's get ahead of it. Um, but let's not... Yeah, and just from, again, from that criminal point of view, I mean, criminals are all about research. We, we research things religiously. We read white papers. We, we pay attention to updates. What is an update? An update is broadcast to every single criminal on the planet <laughs> telling them which door to knock on. That's the only yeah. thing an update is. So we, we do all of that. When, when, when these vulnerabilities are out there, if, if they're ever exposed, I mean, <laughs> you, you have a field day with them. Yeah. That, that's the way this thing works. So, so just to stick your head in the sand, that does not make the problem go away. That just makes you a victim. Again, that's it. And, I, yeah, please. The red team thing is interesting because it's, you know, I think the red teaming idea has evolved over time as well. It's no, it should no longer be the red team comes in, breaks everything, hands a report over. The red teaming for, from the heart is the red teaming sits with the company's yes. team yes. and they work together. Exactly. Walk through every step of it. Here's what I see. Did you see it? Here's what I did. Did you catch The red team has to lose. It has to lose. It's as simple as that. The only reason the red team is there is to build the blue team up. It's as simple as that. So we're all about purple teaming. No red team, no blue team, purple. It's all purple. But the problem is it doesn't scale. <laughs> it doesn't scale when you have 20,000 employees or 200,000 employees. Yeah does not scale. So you shouldn't do it all. And I refuse not sharing, guys. I mean, look, I mean, you came here. You made thousands of miles. And <laughs> thank you so much. And you are sharing your expertise with us in this, in this room. It is very important for us. And we are one team, right? And yeah. everybody has to feel that. And we must really share everything. Guys, I wish we had more time, but I love you. It was so great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you.